Hey guys, John Rada back with episode 89 of a Geek Leader Podcast. And today on the show, we've got Patrick Berry from Raybeck Security. And I met Patrick because uh, he was help- helping me out with a, an internal pen test. And we got to talking, and it was just so interesting and fascinating to learn about um, ethical hacking and cybersecurity from a professional who's in the field doing these things on a regular basis. Um, he's also the CTO of his company. So we're talking a little bit about how he got started, how he founded the company, and uh, some of the uh, important pieces when it comes to cybersecurity and things that leaders need to know and think about to help keep their business and their group and their team all safe from the cyber threats that are out there. This has been just a a fun interview. It was a great conversation. So give it up for Patrick Berry. All right. Welcome to the podcast today. We've got Patrick Berry from uh, Raybeck Security. Did I say that right? You did. You did. Raybeck Security. Sometimes I, I, uh, I mess things up with, uh, with pronunciations. I'm not the the greatest pronouncer of words. I usually struggle when it comes to names. I had uh, someone on the podcast not too long ago who was uh, from Italian uh, background, and I, was, I tried to say her name like 10 times, and I still got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you don't mind, tell the audience a little bit about kind of how you got started into technology and uh, what you're doing now, and, uh, and, and we'll just go from there. Um, sure. So, you know, I, I think, you know, I really got started with technology um, kind of as a home user, um, you know, maybe around 11, 12, got my first uh, PC and first modem. And the first time I, you know, connected and played a video game with my friend across the street, um, I, I was hooked. I wasn't sure uh, what exactly I could do to make a career with it, but um, I, I definitely knew I wanted to be with computers. Um, so I, you know, I, I did uh, a four year degree in management information systems, um, and I was lucky enough to land an internship uh, with a regional bank. Um, in Ohio um, in my senior year, and then they brought me on full time. Um, so I, I spent my first uh, seven years of my career um, with a bank, and uh, it was a good good learning experience. It was a good place to get your hands on a lot of things, and I kind of went through the ranks of support, uh, networking, uh, network administration, uh, network security. Um, so I, I got to see a lot of technologies and see you know, what I liked, what I didn't like, and kind of learn kind of from the ground up. Uh, so it was a good place. And um, so after that, um, I, I was coming on down to Charlotte. I, I did some consulting work um, for one of the big fours for a couple of years um, and realized that that wasn't really where I wanted to be. Um, so we found a um, kind of a small uh, consulting firm here in Charlotte that was kind of focused on IT audits and IT security. So I, I spent about seven years there um, before um, co-founding Revic Security uh, four years ago. And what what kind of motivated you to uh, you know kind of be your own boss and co-found your your, your own company? Well, uh, you know the the funny thing was I actually co-founded it with um, one of my bosses from my previous company. Um, so I, I was constantly in his ear about what I didn't like about the previous company and the opportunities that I saw. And, you know, it, it turns out that he agreed. Um, so really what it boiled down to was, you know, we just saw a need for uh, security. Um, the, the previous company we were at focused a lot on IT audits for banks and financial institutions. And we said, you know, we really need to put more emphasis on the security services, on the you know, external and internal penetration testing, the web application testing, the you know, internal vulnerability assessments. We really need to stress that and push that to more clients, and we need to look outside the banks and credit unions. And, um, you know, try as we might, they just didn't see it our way. So, um, you know, after a couple of frustrating years, we just said, you know what, if, if you won't do it, we will. Um, so that kind of led us to um, folk, or founding Revic Security. And again, like I said, we focus on solely on the offensive security side of, like I said, the, the external internal penetration testing, uh, web application testing. Um, and again, we, we certainly do have quite a few um, banking and credit union and financial institutions as clients today. Um, but again, obviously, our services are compatible to other verticals, and, and that's where uh, the majority of our clients are today. So I know that's how we met because our company was was contracting with you guys. But I want to know, you know, f- from my perspective, I, I kind of 
um, am very familiar with cybersecurity. It's one of the things that I'm interested in. I'm actually sitting here. I've got two books that I just got, um, sort of bought myself for Christmas, the uh, Blue Team Field Manual and the Red Team Field Manual. Oh, very <laughs> nice. Very, very nice. nice. Yes. Um, trying to learn a little bit more and uh, keep myself in, in the loop. And I understand the importance of offensive security, but is that a tough sell sometimes to um, – to uh, uh, executives to come in and say, yeah, we're going to um, basically hack your systems and show you how bad it can be. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, it, it is for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, I, I think there, there's a, a few things that we've run into uh, over the past couple of years, and I'll, I'll just kind of dive briefly into them. Um, you know, the, the first kind of objection that we get is, you know, we have a few folks that unfortunately just rely on their um, cybersecurity insurance. Um, you know, they're, they're not too concerned with the breach or with the loss or with anything because it, it's going to be covered under their, uh, under their insurance policy and they've got, you know, millions or tens of millions of dollars and, and they'll be just fine. Um, generally speaking, most of them probably didn't read the fine print and don't know that, you know, if one person clicks a link most of the time, so those things are null and void. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, um, they'll be sadly mistaken. Um, you know, the other one that we come across is, you know, the, the um, kind of head in the sand approach or the liability approach. Um, you know, if, if we don't know about it, we don't have to fix it or, you know, we're not liable for it. Um, so, you know, we, we do have a couple of conversations that, you know, clients kind of say, well, you know, we know we probably do have some issues and, um, you know, uh, but we're, we're not at a position to fix them yet. So we're, we're just not going to discover them. Uh, we don't want to be liable for that. So, um, you know, we've had that discussions before. Um, and then the, the final one is always budget. Um, you know, what, what do you think you can afford? What did you budget for? You know, did some other projects run over? Um, you know, things like that. It, it's just, you know, with any other kind of IT purchase or project or service, um, you know, there's always going to be a budget consideration as well. Um, so, you know, and, and this conversation, you know, was more difficult five or 10 years ago. Um, but really with, you know, the news, I mean, it, it's been a pretty hot week and I, I don't have the notes in front of me, but I know there was two, three or four relatively big breaches here in the last couple of days. Um, so with, with the coverage and with, you know, some of the news, it's a little bit more mainstream and it, it reaches some of the executives that maybe don't see some of the technical news that you and I would see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I, I think it is getting slightly easier to have that conversation. And I, I think, at least from a value side, a value and budget proposition, I think companies are starting to understand the importance of uh, the security and testing it to make sure that things are secure. Yeah, no, I, I get it. And I, I agree 100%. I've, I remember I've met people at conferences before and I've told them that, oh, yeah, I'm looking for someone to do an internal, uh, external pen test. Uh, do you have any recommendations? You're like, I would never do that because I don't want. Uh, you know, my boss to find out the holes that I know exist. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, why don't you fix them? I mean, d don't you need someone to point out some of those holes so you can fix them? Yeah. You know, and, and you know, that's the, the problem. Uh, we, we've had conversations like that. They, they know the holes exist, but they don't think they can get budget or they don't want to bring up and ask for more money. Um, but you know, I, I said, that's, that's the wrong approach. I mean, you have to at least know that the vulnerabilities are there and, and make, you know, make your supervisors, make the bosses aware that, hey, there is a vulnerability, there is a need, and, and now at least it, it's on them to make that decision. Um, you know, yes, we will accept that risk or, you know, yes, we'll go ahead and purchase what we need to purchase. Um, but certainly you should always make that, uh, make those vulnerabilities aware to your supervisors and your superiors. Uh, yeah, I, I think so too. I think you can't really plan um, accordingly if you don't know what, what's out there. Um, so what got you interested in, um, or, or how, not necessarily, you already mentioned kind of what got you interested in, in the offensive security side, but how did you go about learning some of these, uh, tactics and some of the things that, um, that, that are important to your, your job, I guess, when it comes to, um, offensive security? Mm -hmm. Um, so really at my previous company, um, you know, they had two or three pen testers, um, on board, um, as well as maybe about 15 or 20 folks doing IT audits and some other light security work. Um, so honestly, where I learned the most from and, and the most useful, 
um, really was from working with some of my my colleagues. And you know, obviously, we've we've all kept in touch, as I'm, I'm sure you're aware. The cybersecurity community uh, as a whole is a relatively um, you know tight knit and helpful community. So um, I, I've really worked with you know worked with those guys previously and kept in touch with those guys uh, in the past and and girls. Um, some certainly very helpful folks that have taken the time to say you know here's here's what I've used, here's what's helpful, you know, here's what's not helpful. If you really need to get down to the nitty gritty, this is what's going to be helpful for you. Um, so really, you know, trying to learn from coworkers uh, as much as possible. Uh, and then I was lucky enough, you know, I'm giving them a free plug, uh, the SANS training. I, I got to go to a couple of SANS trainings, um, excellent trainings, um, you know, good material, um, excellent instructors. Um, you know, good pieces of, of hands-on certification behind it. So um, certainly do think some of the trainings out there um, are valuable. Um, and I am looking to take a couple more uh, kind of hands-on red team focused courses this year. Um, so I'll certainly report back if I find anything that's um, extraordinary. Uh, but I, I really think um, those two are, have probably been the most valuable um, and then really probably like most security professionals, um, you know, tons of reading, tons of surfing, um, you know, looking through um, Reddit forums, looking through other types of, you know, um, security forums, seeing what other people are doing um, and, and what's out there and just kind of keeping your ear to the ground um, and, and see what's going on in the community. Hmm. So what would you think or, or say are some of the things that tech leaders need to um be thinking about when it comes to security that they're probably not thinking about today? Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things they need to think about um, is the, what they're using, um, where it's hosted, um, you know, the, the amount of access that's in the cloud nowadays that the end user has access to, that the, the common employee has access to, um, it is pretty staggering. Um, and, and a lot of people aren't, Taking that into account, um, you know, these are services and accounts that are going to be accessible to anybody online with an internet connection, any in the anywhere in the world, twenty four seven. So we we commonly see, uh, you know, OWAs or VPNs or SharePoint portals or any other type of cloud service that you know, um, be it uh, you know Salesforce, uh, WordPress, anything like that. Um, we see that. They're not using multi-factor that's available for them. Um, so I, I think the the executives sometimes don't understand the amount of remote access um, and the the depth of the remote access that's available to some of their employees um, and what they should really be doing to protect those uh, because those are high priority targets. Um, they're easy to find. They're easy to scan. They're in the same place on the internet twenty four seven. Um, so they're they're prime targets. Um, so that's that's one of the big things that we we tell you know some of the executives is think about all of the services that you're using, um, and then kind of on the flip side of that, um, we also recommend they they really start taking a deep dive at the vendor access that they're granting. Um, you know who do you let into your system? How do they get into your system? What types of access do they have to your network, um, and how can we limit that access and make that more secure? Um, so those are two big things uh, that have been, you know, some pretty hot topics and some good conversations over the past six months uh, that we've had with some executives. How, how does like uh, shadow IT kind of fall into that realm when it comes to like where things are hosted? Have you seen um, maybe an uptick in departments kind of doing their own thing and bypassing technology groups? Um, you know, it, it happens. Um, you know, luckily, uh, most folks, uh, I, I have actually kind of seen a decrease. Um, you know, I, I think it was more prevalent, I, I want to say maybe, you know, seven to 10 years ago when the IT folks were typically known as the no department. Um, you know, I, I think there's a couple of reasons. I think IT departments have adapted quite a bit. I think there's some more flexibility, um, you know, especially now with clouds and VMs and being able to serve up environments for people if they need them on a you know uh, low cost and low overhead basis. Um, so I think the IT staff in most environments have, have become a little bit more flexible um, in that regard. Um, but uh, 
oh, I kind of lost my train of thought here. Um, where was I going with that? The uh, shadow IT. Um, oh, and also the the oversight now that most IT departments have, and the the security and the controls that they've put in place kind of has really scaled that back. Um, you know, five or ten years ago, you used to walk into almost any enterprise anywhere, um, and you know there was you know. 60, 70, 100 percent people had local admin access. They could do whatever they wanted. It was kind of the wild west on the local desktop. Um, and now there, there's much better controls, much better visibility into that as well, as far as you know, advances in the web filtering, things of that nature. So um, I, I think they, they've they've put better controls in place as well. So I, I personally have have not really had as many complaints or headaches um, as I have in the past, um, but it certainly is still out there and it does exist. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, it just seems like it's so easy today when you talked about like hosting your things for, for, um, any, anybody with a credit card, how many credit card to go out yeah. and purchase some, mm-hmm. some hosted service somewhere. Well, that's, you know, that is one of the things that we, we do with our engagements and, and we always recommend, um, you know, if, if we're testing web filtering and things like that, we say, look, you know, outside of your IT department, we wouldn't expect any user to need to RDP, they shouldn't need access to AWS. They don't need access to log me in. They don't need access to GitHub. You know, turn all this stuff off. Um, you know, so that that does kind of fall into you know some of the things that you know uh, the exec, no, not necessarily the executives, but the the administrator should be checking from a firewall and a web filtering perspective, making sure that the protocols are blocked. Um, for like I said, I, I would expect most folks outside of IT wouldn't have a need for that type of stuff. Yeah, no, I agree a hundred percent. And it's one of those things that I think now, you know, before it was, you know, how do you how do you tell, if, you know, if your team is signing up for for tools or signing up for you know cloud services and software as a service somewhere else? But now you have you know products, you know, like like the, the Palo Alto that can give you some nice reporting of uh, users that are visiting certain sites and mm-hmm. so on and so forth, so you can kind of address that early on. Yeah, and, you know, it would have to be, again, there's, there's certainly ways around it, you know, you, you take it to the next level of, well, what do they do if they decide to take their personal laptop and go to a Starbucks and sign up for it and then access it later, you know I mean? There's only so much you can do, but when you're when you're watching an internal network, um, like I said, yeah, the, the web filtering and reports like that from Palo Alto and things are, are definitely something to keep an eye on. Yeah. Um, do you think that when it comes to, you know, securing your network and, and your security and uh, h- how important is user training and end user training for all the employees and things like that? Do you think that's like as, as, as important as people say it is, or is it kind of just one of those things that you do to just, just to check the box? Um, you know, there, there's varying opinions and I, I swear, I think my mind changes back and forth based on results. Um, but honestly, it, it is important. Um, and I think it's important to get the user to understand that it's important. Um, that's part of the, the training goals that should be in place. Um, you know, I, I was always a proponent, especially you know when it comes to, to phishing. I mean, you know, your only real solution is tighten up your spam filters, hope nothing gets by, and then train the users. Um, and and I, I, that was just kind of my thing. I said, well, train the user, train the user, train the user. That's all you can do. Um, and I, I think it was last year, maybe two years ago, um, out at DEF CON, I, I was listening to a talk, and the guy said, you know, you can be the greatest, most entertaining, most knowledgeable, best speaker, presenter in the world, if there's 10,000 people or 1,000 people in a room looking at you or watching your presentation, at least one of them is not paying attention. Um, and like I said, we all know in the case of phishing, it only takes one user. Um, but it, it is important, and it's important, you know, I think, to make the users aware of the, the impact and the possible consequences. Um, you know, and it doesn't need to be a straight fear campaign. Um, but what we see a lot of times is, you know, when, when companies do an annual or a quarterly phishing test and they get the results back and they say, okay, well, you know, they contact the users, well, you guys failed the test and, you know, just be more careful and we'll do some extra training. And, and that's typically, you know, the way it goes. Um, but, you know, it, it can honestly be realistically that, you know, okay, you failed the phishing test. You click the link, you got infected with malware, they got into your system, they siphoned off 10 gigs worth of data. Now we have to alert all of our customers. We have to pay you know, all that money for credit monitoring for two years. 
um, we're going to have to let you go. Um, so, I mean, there, there are really real consequences, um, you know, to, to those actions. Um, and, and I think that the users, like I said, as part of that user training, they need to be aware of what, what really does happen um, in the cases of a breach. Um, you know, like there, there are much more crucial consequences than just, you know, failing a test when you know, an auditor or a security person is, is doing that test. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I've noticed um, definitely more awareness after we implemented our security awareness program, <laughs> which which is good. That's what you should do. Oh, and I've also noticed um, more people like um, you know coming to us and saying, "Oh, I saw I saw you guys send a, a fake you know phishing." They're like, "No, we didn't." I'm glad you you called yeah. it. Yeah. And um, I think that's been very helpful. Um, as well, but it also has changed the culture a little bit to make it more like people are more on guard and more paying attention, which is, you know, very, very helpful, but it's still, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, solve the problem, but I do think it helps. No, it, it's, it's, you know, uh, again, it's, it's a layer. I mean, if you put right. the AV on the machine, you put the web filter out there and you train the user and put a couple other things out there in place and, and hope for the best, um, you know, it, it, but again, making sure that they're aware of it, um, and, and again, keeping that in the forefront of their mind, and that's that is the you know um, the, the thing that you mentioned was um, they're they're more aware, they're more on guard, and you know it's it's unfortunate that that's what you have to be uh, nowadays online, but that's what you have to be. You have to be uh, slightly paranoid, and that's the best yeah. way to approach it. Yeah, yeah, I, I and sometimes you're, you're too paranoid. At least I am. Oh, no, absolutely. absolutely. Um, well, no, like I said, I, every time I, I leave DEF CON or Derby CON or, or one of those things and see some crazy talks, I'm like, oh, no, yeah, we were, we were right to be that paranoid. I, I see why now. Um, so I, I certainly think, you know, you can, you can go pretty far um, in the world of, of being paranoid, just, just, be, just shy of the tinfoil hat, I think. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to get into one thing. I know um, when um, I've had people come in to do pen tests before, a lot of times they, they focus on the uh, vulnerabilities and just the vulnerabilities and listing just here's all your vulnerabilities. And one thing that I think you guys did that was a little bit different that I really liked was you, you took that approach at, at the beginning, but then you took the approach, you know, perspective of what would be the most uh, or the worst day possible for you. <laughs> and, and let's see if we can make that happen. And I think what that did for me is in the past when we've done these things, we have this list of vulnerabilities. I take that report, I show my boss and, you know, but there's not a story behind it, mm-hmm. but being able to put that, that worst day uh, scenario and, and play it through and put some screenshots and things along with that tells a story that kind of, Oh wow, we really got to fix this now instead of, Oh yeah, that's a problem we know, but it's probably not going to happen. Let's you know, kick the can down the road. Um, what gave you guys the insight to try something like that? Well, again, it really came down to you know trying to understand who our clientele and, and, and who the end user for our report was going to be. And you know, obviously, it's going to get into the hands of the technical folks, the IT staff, the network administrators, and, and we know that we wanted to put together some technical details to help them get that remediated. So that that was one of our main goals. Um, but the other side of it, you know, in, in co-founding this business and, and wanting to grow this business, you know, we realize a lot of times the people that make the decision of who's going to get hired and who's going to get rehired is going to be those senior level folks. And we realize a lot of times seeing, you know, uh, the, the stoplight chart of red, yellow, green, you know, we know red's bad, it's critical, um, you know, there's a high vulnerability, it's orange. Um, okay, if we see too many red, we, you know, the, the senior executives know it's not a good thing, um, but they don't necessarily have the technical knowledge to, uh, you know, kind of put the dots together of how bad of a thing that could be. Um, so that's really what we wanted to do was say, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put the technical information in there as well. Uh, but we really want to show what would happen. And to be quite honest, when, when you come in and, and list all the vulnerabilities, um, that's that's great uh, for, from, a, from a baseline perspective, but no attacker is going to come in and try to check for all their vulnerabilities. They're going to check for their, their four or five or six that work the best, um, and they're going to hope that you know, you're vulnerable to one of those five or six. And once they do that, they're going to start, you know, like I said, depending on what they're after, be it, you know, information or, you know, financial data or other transactions, 
that's that's what they're going to start targeting. So that's kind of what we wanted to emulate. We said, you know, a real world attacker is not going to try to exploit every weakness. They're going to try to exploit the most vulnerable that they can get in and out the, the quickest and the quietest. Um, so that's really what we wanted to do and kind of paint that true picture of, of what a real attack would look like. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good approach because it, it's, it's one thing just to see the holes, but it's another thing to see the damage that can come from those holes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's that's really... Because that, that paints the picture, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, the, the senior executives, they're the ones that are going to have to take those questions of, you know, how did this happen? Why did this happen? Um, and, and I think seeing some of that data exposed publicly really gets them thinking and, and kind of get them understanding that, you know what, um, we better fix this. So I, I don't want to take those phone calls from the, you know, from the news channel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let me ask you uh, a kind of a random question, I guess, when it comes to, you know, your friends probably know what you do, right? For a living. Yes, yes. <laughs> do any of them look at you a little bit differently or, or, uh, or ever ask you, you know, some hacker, hackerish questions? <laughs> uh, well, actually, yeah, I just, I just had one of my friends ask if I could uh, hack into somebody's website because they, uh, they posted something they shouldn't have. Um, you know, but I, I don't think that, I don't think too many of them look at me differently because, you know, at, to be honest, I don't know that too many of them understand the full depth of exactly what I do um, on, on a day-to-day basis or, or the potential of some of the things that we've, we've done in the past. Um, I, I do have a couple of, of friends that you know are, are on more on the technical side and, and kind of understand that. And, and you know, I, I don't think that they treat me any differently, uh, but they certainly do ask. You know, a lot of times when. Uh, a, a new hot vulnerability comes out that'll get you know a, a new name like crack attack or whatever <laughs> some of the other hot ones were you know they'll ask me is it is it hype or is it something I really need to patch or take offline until I fix it um, uh, but outside of that you know I, I don't think so and then you know to be quite honest you know a lot of the folks I talk to and are friends with uh, and probably chat with the most on a day to day basis or other infosec folks that you know know the same stuff i know and can do the same stuff that i can do so um you know we don't really you know get into that a whole lot or don't treat anybody differently so uh, i think <clears throat> kind of hanging out with the same crew um of, of people as well um so I, I don't get that too often as far as getting treated any differently <laughs> yeah i had a um when i was i, I teach part-time at uh, york technical college mm-hmm. and I, I taught um uh one semester it's been like 10 years ago now, I think I taught um, um, cyber forensics and a, an ethical hacking course. It was like the intro to ethical hacking mm-hmm. like the first semester. This is, you know, a decade ago. And one of my cousins found out about it and he swears to this day that I'm an anonymous or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will tell you, I, I have done a couple of presentations, um, kind of the banking industry and I've done a couple in the insurance industry. Um, and, and we do um, uh, our card cloner, um, where we take somebody's badge and clone it to a blank badge. It takes a couple seconds. It makes a little beep noise, and that's it. Um, so I, I've done that live for a couple and usually clone quite a few badges in the room. Um, and then people do look at me kind of funny, and I, I have seen people kind of clutch or shut their laptop when I walk by. Um, so I, I have seen that from, from you know being at conferences. So I, I have got that a little bit. Yeah, I know when I whenever I go to cybersecurity conferences, it's like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are off the whole time. Absolutely, <laughs> anything, Absolutely. anything with me uh, uh, of value for sure. Um, so when it, when it gets into uh, starting your own company and kind of c- kind of go, going through that route and trying to find customers, was there any fear that you know maybe this thing isn't going to work, or or maybe I, I'm not cut out to doing this, or or anything like that that you had to encounter or, or overcome? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, probably every day for the first year, <laughs> um, you know, we, we weren't sure, you know, it, it, the, we have a saying that nothing is finalized until the contract signed. Um, so, you know, there, there was a couple circumstances, um, obviously leaving a previous company and forming a competitor. Um, you know, we wanted to abide kind of by, I guess, more or less gentlemanly rules. And, you know, we didn't target any of our previous clients, um, at least not immediately or within the first year. 
um, just for sake of you know not having to have uncomfortable conversations and possibly lawyers involved and things like that. Um, so I think you know the initial thought of yeah we'll be able to have some customers right off the bat um, didn't exactly work out, um, and, and then you know there were some larger deals that we kind of thought you know these are really going to help kick us off in the right direction. Um, and, you know, in, in our minds, they were 98% done. Um, and it turns out, you know, those didn't fall through in the first year. Um, but when those didn't, and, you know, some of the short buyer deals that we thought were going to get signed in, um, you know, we'd get a random request from somebody or somebody would refer us a client or, you know, we would make a call and, and have a conversation and, and close a deal. Um, so, I, I think the certainly the ups and downs, um, you know, you, you just don't know what to expect. So I, mean, I, I think we've kind of tried to level ourselves off or kind of even ourselves off over the years. And, you know, we, we just, like I said, we don't get too high or too low and, until the contract signed. Yeah, I think that's a good approach. Um, and was there anything you had to like coach yourself or talk to yourself about to, to keep going with it and not give up and not, not get uh, too overcome by the fear of where's the next client coming from? Uh, you know, to be honest, luckily, no. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think it was, you know, and that was, that was part of planning. Um, you know, prior to co-founding the company, I, I scrolled as much away as I could. Um, and then luckily I, I had all of my debt paid off prior to starting the company. So I was able to rack my credit cards all the way back up again. Um, <laughs> so I, I knew, uh, you know, I, I had to, you know, change a couple things and, and some things are going to be different in my life for, for a couple of years. Um, but it, it was never to the point where, um, you know, we weren't going to survive. Um, you know, we, we, there were, you know, for the first year, we didn't take a paycheck. Um, you know, there were some months in the second year we were we weren't sure if our paychecks were going to clear. Uh, but again, there was never any any thought of yeah, this isn't going to work or we're going to stop. Um, you know, pay them. It, it was well, um, calendars open, money's running out. We better figure out you know who we want to start cold calling or what buildings we want to show up at and see if we can talk to somebody. Um, but yeah, there there was never any any thought that we wanted to stop um you know and i I think again we're lucky to be in this field um because again if if that was ever a thought um i'd like to think i could go get a job somewhere else in a relatively short order so i always kept that in my back pocket and and, you know not to go drive myself crazy while trying to get this thing off the ground Um, but like i said luckily we were able to land a couple good clients, a couple of large deals that we said, okay, you know, that's, that's going to keep the lights on and that'll keep us, you know, a little bit of money in our pocket while we continue to grow. So we we were very lucky with that. Yeah. Do do you think, um, um, do do you think there's a lack of talent in this field by any chance or, um, because I I hear different things from different podcasts, like, oh, you need to go to cybersecurity. Then I hear like, you know, there's a shortage of cybersecurity folks. Is is that true? Or is that just kind of the hype right now? (sighs) You know, um, I, I, I can't really say, um, again, I think being in, in the community, I feel like there's a, there's a ton of people available and I mean, you know, everybody's gainfully employed. Uh, I don't, I don't know too many people that are unemployed. Um, but you know, I don't know that there's this mass shortage of, you know, 1.2 million tech workers or whatever it was supposed to be. Um, I, I don't know that that's the case. Um, I, I know, you know, from what we're finding out, trying to trying to hire some folks is, you know, it, it's a hot market right now. It's a workers' market. Um, the, the, the demand and salary is there, um, so it, it's definitely a hot market. But um, I, I don't know. You know, I, I think the the what I hear more than the security shortage is uh, developers and programmers. Um, nobody in Charlotte can find a .NET developer to save their life. Um, so. You know, I, I don't know that we have quite that type of shortage, um, you know, but <clears throat> there's, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think there's quite the, the, the mass shortage that the, the media shows. Um, mm-hmm. But again, it's one of those things that could change, I think, very quickly with the new technology. So there, there may be very shortly. 
Yeah, yeah, I, th- no, I think I think you're you're right about that because um, I, I hear it, but I don't see it when it comes to like the the job market as yeah. much as I do hear about it in the media. But I remember just a couple of years ago, I was trying to hire a .NET developer. <laughs> and I went to a recruiter. He's like, "Yeah, for every ten openings, I've got one .NET developer. I've, I got a place." <laughs> you know? Yeah. And um, I, I think we had that open spot for I want to say it, it was more than a year before we found someone that we could afford. Yeah, if you're not if you're not willing to overpay, you're not going to get somebody for probably a good six months. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy right now. Um, well, I wanted to ask you uh, one last question. Just, do you have any advice for um, team leads, managers, or IT leaders at all about um, how they can stay current with uh, uh, cybersecurity changes and uh, breaches in the news and things like that that you think are important? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, so one of the things, you know, if they're not in, you know, security themselves and they, they manage or, or work with a security department, make friends, talk to them. Um, like I said, a lot of folks in the security world are, are friendly and more than willing to share um, their knowledge uh, as long as you're willing to put in the work and learn. Um, so I, you know, I always ask my friends, you know, uh, what podcasts they listen to, um, you know, what are they reading? Um, you know, what websites they have, hot uh, bookmarks. Um, so, you know, certainly take advantage of the people within your own um, organization. Um, again, you know, not to continually you know, plug SANS, but their, their trainings are excellent. Um, they're excellent networking events as well. Um, so I, I certainly recommend if you could afford one of those um, to go check one of those out. Um, you know, DEF CON or any of the local cons in your area, uh, you know, I, I certainly recommend going to listen to some of those talks. A lot of great talks um, come out of those cons. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to um, there's going to be a Cacolac Con coming up in, um, I believe, August in Raleigh. Um, it's going to have some good talks. So I think that's um, certainly one way to stay um, stay involved and stay current is, you know, see what's going on in your community. If there's any, um, you know, B-sides, any hacker meetups, um, you know, any all 2,600 groups in, in the area, um, anything like that, um, just kind of get some like-minded people and, and chat about the same kind of thing and keep up to date. Um, I think is probably the, the best way and, and it's uh, makes it a little bit more fun than just sitting behind a computer screen and, and reading article after article. Yeah, I, I agree hundred percent. A couple of the shows that, that I like to listen to are uh, the, the cyber wire and uh, hacking humans. Those are two that, that kind of keep me abreast of things that are going on. Yeah. Um, I always listen to um, and a lot of um, Paul Asadorian's security weekly. Um, oh yeah. That's a good one too. And then um, I always listen to the, the quick five minute um, internet stormcast uh, top five hitters for the day. Um, uh, just to make sure I didn't miss anything or overlook anything for the day. Yeah. So um, one last question, how can people uh, find out more about uh, Rayback security or uh, you and they connect with you? Sure. Uh, well, you can um, come on over to Rebic Security. It's www.rebicsecurity.com, and that's R-E-B-Y-C security.com. Um, we have a contact page there, um, and all of our information about the services that we offer and um, anything else that you might want to learn. Um, we do have a blog there um, that we try our best to update uh, regularly. Um, that usually will have some pretty good tips and tricks as far as keeping yourself safe at work and at home. Um, and then as far as myself, uh, I can certainly be reached through that web page uh, or my email address is pbarry, B-A-R-R-Y, at reddicsecurity.com. Or you can certainly find uh, find me on LinkedIn under Patrick Barry, and I am the CIO at Reddick Security. And you can feel free to reach out and um, connect with me. All right, I'll link those up in the show notes as well so people can uh, can browse the sites into your LinkedIn page. Um, and I really appreciate having you on. It's been a lot of fun. Great, John. Well, I really appreciate you having me. Thanks so much. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Patrick Berry uh, from Rayback Security. And be sure to um, visit their website. You can find all that information in the show notes at geekleader.com. And if you've enjoyed this, please hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn or leave me a review either in iTunes um, or wherever, Stitcher, wherever you guys get your podcast. Um, just a side note, we are available on um, iHeartRadio, Spotify, um, again, iTunes, Google Play, Music, and anywhere else you can find podcasts, Overcast, um, Castbox, 
uh, play a pod. I, I can't think of any more, but uh, I'm sure there's, they're out there. Every now and then I go to the app store and I'll find a new podcast and check it out. And sure enough, we've got a couple of subscribers or something there, which is pretty cool. It's great to see that. Uh, but definitely leave me a review. I love to hear your feedback. Thanks so much.